introduce a lovely lady, but apparently he might still be traveling. Um, so tonight, uh, Tom Yule uh, recommended this person to share with us and um, I didn't, don't know a thing about her other than the brief conversation I had with her to talk about what this um, meeting workshop does. And I got a really good feel for her. Don't have anything up more than you know about her other than I think we're gonna get a good share here. With that, I'll uh, open it up for Kristen to begin. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Don. Um, my name is Kristen, I am an alcoholic. Uh, good to be here. There's a lot of people I know on this uh, meeting, so it's nice to see people. Um, Dawn, nice to connect with you as well the other day. Um, and I have a quick little funny story about Tom Yule. I live in Pennsylvania and um, but I had lived in California for almost 30 years, close to 30. And uh, my dad, I take care of my father. He's 90 and he has dementia. And I moved here about almost eight years ago. And um, my mother was alive and she couldn't do it all. So I came home to help my parents. And, um, but I drove cross country. And um, I stopped in New Mexico and stopped in Santa Fe and um, went to Tom's meeting and um, actually took an anniversary trip there at his meeting and um, left and went on my merry way. And I came to Pennsylvania and uh, I didn't know anybody here uh, other than my family, but I mean, you know, I didn't know anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous here, left a very strong home group, left a lot of community behind. And here I was in Pennsylvania and I was, I was looking for all of you. And, um, you know, I was looking for people who were de dedicated to the big book and went to a lot of meetings. And I thought, okay, maybe this is it. And you know, I don't know. I just wasn't hearing a real message with death and weight for me. This is just my experience. There was no judgment, but I had a very strong home group. And I was sitting in this meeting on a Monday night in, in Pennsylvania, and they were having an anniversary. And they said, um, and we're having two speakers, and it's Tom and Juanita Yule. <laughs> and I sort of snapped up out of my seat, like, how did this happen? And, you know, two weeks later, there were Tom and Juanita, and I was just so grateful for that, um, which just shows me that uh, I have always been taken care of. I have always been taken care of. One more time. Um, just real quickly, uh, I did most of my drinking in the East, and um, you know, my drinking story isn't very exciting. It's, it's the run of the mill drinking story. But the one thing I knew about my drinking and I didn't understand it until you all got a hold of me. But while I was drinking, even at a young age, I understood this and that was this. Once I start, I can't stop. I knew that. I mean, I was probably 20 and I knew that. I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand why. Uh, but I knew uh, that that's what was happening. And so when you don't really understand something, you'll make stuff up. So I wasn't cute enough. I wasn't thin enough. I wasn't educated enough. You fill in the blank. It doesn't matter. I wasn't something enough. I didn't want it. I wanted to stay out till eight in the morning, nine in the morning, you know, whatever. Um, and I knew that very early in my drinking. And then as my drinking progressed, um, I didn't really understand this until y'all got a hold of me, but um, I started to see that maybe I couldn't stop, but I'm not really going to admit to that because like, you know, come on now. And um, so, uh, you know, kept on drinking until I came to that place where it talks about in the big book 
you know, I could no longer live with it and I could no longer live without it. And I really don't know, you know, what brought me in. It wasn't a single event in my life. I mean, I know alcohol brought me in, but it wasn't a single bone crushing event. I wasn't praying to the porcelain God and I stood up and I was sober. I mean, really my experience is that um, one day I was drinking and the next I wasn't. And I knew I didn't produce that effect. I knew that something happened to me. I didn't know what it was. I had been to Alcoholics Anonymous a year prior to that. Uh, stayed for two meetings, cried the whole time. Couldn't believe this is where my life ended up. I was too young for this. Please, God, come on now. Please, I'm begging you. This is not where I want to end up. And um, and so I did what every good drunk does, which is I'm just going to do it on my own. I'm going to I'm going to do this on my own. And and I drank for another 12, 14 months. And um, and then I was back in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had only heard of AA one other time prior to that. And um, and that was when I was 23 years old. I went to a psychiatrist and he was like, you know, well, maybe you need AA. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I had no idea what AA was. I didn't even know I knew about it. But I guess I had because I had an opinion about it. But anyway, um, so I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can tell you when I came in. What's the swearing on this meeting? Because I tend to swear. I don't know. I can. I can't. No. Okay. Uh, I tend to swear. So I'll try not to. Um, you can swear. Just keep it to a minimum. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> ah, sometimes it flies out. Um, but yeah, I, um, so I, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, uh, and I can tell you that was divine intervention. That thing that drove me to drink, which I did not know that the word for that was obsession, but that thing that drove me to drink was no longer on me. I knew it because I would have been drinking. And, um, but I was afraid to talk about it. I was in, you know, I didn't know that y'all knew about that. And so I was afraid to talk about it. And I just kind of kept it to myself, but Went to AA meetings, came in um, really unhappy, really miserable, uh, spiritually completely defunct. I was uh, physically and mentally out of my body and out of my mind. And, um, and but I kept going to meetings. I didn't know what else to do. And I came in and, and my whole attitude towards God was, F you, you stay on your side of the street. I'm going to stay on my side of the street. I don't like you. And you don't like me, so we're not going to meet up. So just, you know, so that was my attitude <laughs> when I first came into AA. And um, I just kept coming back because I didn't know what else to do. And so fast forward a couple of years and I, I got sober in a tiny town in Virginia. And um, I left Virginia and I moved to California. And um, I ended up, I remember I was about, four years sober. Now I had a sponsor in Virginia. And um, when I got to California, I got a sponsor because that's what I was supposed to do. But my story is interesting here because I'm now about four years sober. And I remember standing outside of a club, an Alano club, which I had never even known existed till I moved to California. And um, I had a cigarette in this hand and a cup of coffee in this hand, and I was still telling the world to F off, and I knew I was in trouble. I knew nothing had changed except that this was coffee and not booze. Um, but I didn't know what was wrong with me. I was doing what everybody told me. I had commitments. I had a sponsor. I was going to meetings, blah, blah, blah. Um, I was going to four or five meetings a week at least, and uh, I just didn't know what was wrong with me, but I knew I was in trouble, and, um, you know, a couple years marched by, and I'm now about six and a half years sober, and I'm this close to taking my own life, and I don't understand that. Um, I don't understand who's going to tell my parents that this isn't what I wanted to do. It's not what I want to do, but I can see it's coming down the pike. 
And I didn't understand that. I was incredibly confused. I was in enormous amounts of pain. Um, you name it. I mean, I was angry as the day is long. I mean, I was angry when I came in. Now I'm six and a half years away from a drink and I'm angrier than ever. And um, I remember the woman that was sponsoring me. I said to her, you know, look, maybe I'm not alcoholic. I said, maybe I'm just um, an effed up party girl who used booze to get over that. You know, maybe I just have grave emotional mental disorders. And she said, you do have grave emotional mental disorders, but you're also alcoholic. And I said, well, how do you know that if I don't? And, um, you know, this power one more time saw fit to steer me to a group of people. So I met a gentleman who was my Eskimo who took me to a meeting. And I remember walking in that meeting. This was, I don't know, 20 minutes from my house, but in LA, that's an hour away. And um, I ended up going into this meeting and people were talking about being recovered in a way that hit me here in a way that hit me here. And I was, I remember sitting in that meeting, it was on a Tuesday night and I remember, where have you been my whole sobriety? Like, where have you people been? Like they knew what was ailing me. They knew that just because the drink is put down does not mean you're gonna get better. In fact, I was worse off at six and a half years sober without a drink than I had been when I first walked in. And, um, and so in that meeting, I sat in that meeting. I mean, it was my lifeline and I knew it. You know, when you're drowning, you don't care. You know, you have no preference. There's no like, no, I'll wait for a yacht to come along. No, you will grab a popsicle stick if it's floating in the water and you're drowning. And um, so that group was my lifeline. And I sat in that meeting for a little while, probably about three months. I didn't know who to ask who to sponsor me. And uh, I mean, I was crazier than a loon, I can tell you, like crazy. And um, there was a gentleman who came into that meeting and um, the man sitting in the chair who was speaking and who he had been talking about, who he had been when he was drinking and running around town, I knew were two different people. I knew like, if you want what we have is in here. And I knew like immediately, like this guy has some, I didn't talk like this. This guy has something that I want. Cause I didn't know, you know, all the lingo of, even though I'd been in AA for six and a half years, I just, you know, I mean, my experience with the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous was, well, that old cat, Bill Wilson. I mean, come on, that was the 1930s. Like, let's get hip. Like, come on. I, I don't have anything in common with him. I would have drank with Bill, let me tell you. Anyway, um, so um, this gentleman who had been talking at the meeting, uh, after the meeting, I asked him, would you work with me? I didn't care if it was a clown, if he had the answer. I didn't care what this person, male, female, I don't care. I was in desperate straits and I knew it. And um, he said, well, I think you should talk to my wife. <laughs> And I said, okay. And what I found out was they lived a mile down the street from me. Um, and so I set out to go through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And my life began to change. I mean, my life began to change in ways that I can't even, I mean, we all know, you know, you come in and you sit around for a while and don't do anything. And if you're really an alcoholic, your life will not get better. And um, and so I set about doing um, those 12 steps. And, you know, when she said, we're meeting every Monday night at your house, I, I didn't care if the world was blowing up, I was going to be there. And so um, I set about doing the steps. And I remember when I wrote that first inventory, um, I really didn't understand um, what the inventory was about. And I've done subsequent inventories. And I've had great um, movement uh, in that inventory process. You know, when you're not writing the inventory, when this power is writing the inventory, this stuff gets moved out of the way that you've been clinging on to your whole life. 
you know, and I didn't know that. And um, I can remember writing this inventory. I remember my mother showed up on just about every inventory I'd written. And, um, and I remember writing this inventory and I knew like if, when I was writing the first three columns, fine. But when it came to that fourth column of that resentment inventory, I knew that if I just said, well, she did the best she could, it wasn't personal, like, uh uh, I'm going to walk out of this inventory just as mad at her as when I walked into it. I knew, like, this is it right now. Something needs to happen. And I remember I went to this gentleman's house and the one I was talking about, and uh, I said, you know, I, I cannot see this with my mom. I can't, I can't get over this. I just, I cannot. And he said, well, I guess you got to sit in it longer. And I was like, are you effing kidding? You got to be kidding me. I got to sit. And that night I went home. Now, see, this is how I think the power, the, whatever you want to call that power. This is how I think it runs the universe or how it works. I was genuine in my seeking. I genuinely did not want to be angry at my mother. It wasn't a head thing. It was a heart thing for sure. And, um, and that guy said, well, I guess you need to sit in it a little bit more. And I went home and my sister called me. I'm one of five. My sister called me. It was late at night. And she said, um, can I talk to you about mom? I said, sure, go ahead. We were on the phone for two hours. And I saw it. Oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. And I wrote that rest of that inventory on my mom, and I was free. I was free. I didn't even need to share. I mean, I shared it in a fifth step. Of course, I did. But I was like, I got it. I mean, it was right then and there. And I believe that's how God moves. I've never been the cause of something, but I have certainly been the effect of it. And um, so I went on to um, read that fifth step. And I think at that time, I didn't really understand six and seven. I think six and seven, you know, I think six and seven are two for me. Again, I speak only from my own experience. Today in my life, six and seven are huge because I can see that self that wants to be in control, we call it ego, call it self, call it what you will. But when it wants to be in control, I got to get down on this. I got to get on my knees and get into six and seven because I am not capable of changing myself. I'm capable of being changed for sure. I have been changed by Alcoholics Anonymous and this power and all and from the help of all of you. But I am not capable of changing myself. And um, six and seven, I, I don't think I really understood it at that time, but it plays a much more important role in my life today. And um, wrote those amends, didn't want to do it, balked in amends for I don't know how long. And um, I remember, I balked for a long time, but I remember um, when I finished that amends process, it, it felt like this is a kind of a silly analogy, but it felt like I was swimming in a salt water pool. And then I really got shot out into the ocean. And I was like, oh, this is what salt water. <laughs> I mean, it was just this wide open expanse of space, you know, where the whole time I've been swimming in a salt water pool thinking I'm in the ocean till I finished those amends. And it was like, oh, oh, okay, this is, wow, okay. Um, and so where am I at in my life today? I think that's important. Um, like I told you guys, um, I do take care of my father and I came home to take care of my mother. Now, this is what I also, the power of God, I could cry about this because my mother ended up on every inventory that I had ever written. And here I am the girl that was given the seat assignment to come home and take care of her parents. Like, I don't know how that happens other than this power. You know, I don't, people think it's a choice. Like I made a choice to come home and take care of my parents. I really don't believe that. I believe it was a seat assignment by this power. And um, 
I'm telling you, the girl that walked into the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, who did not want to do this uh, for anybody at any time in my life, is the girl who is at home taking care of her father. And I took care of my mother until she died. And I was in the room with her when she died. I, that kind of transformation I was never capable of. But because I believe in the power of the 12 steps, I have faith in the power of the 12 steps. I have enormous faith in Alcoholics Anonymous. And from that, I have discovered a faith and a power greater than myself that I had no idea. I mean, my idea of God was what existed in my head. You know, um, Sarah read uh, that pamphlet. And at the very end of that pamphlet, when I read it, I've, I read that a long time ago. It's in um, Language of the Heart. And I, I uh, today, when I reread it, it said, at the very bottom, we die of what we eat and drink. But most we die of what we think. <laughs> and that's true. You know, we're telling a story about the story about the story, you know on and on and on and I'm missing what's going on and so to be the person and I kind of always knew it you know that kind of knowing that bypasses the mind I knew when I could see what was sort of going on in my parents life I knew it was going to be me and I don't know why and it's not important but to be changed enough to be able to come home and hold my mom's hand while she was dying and to take care of my 90 year old father is extraordinary to me because I am a girl who could not see beyond her own palm of her own hand. I mean, the way I lived my life was so subhuman. I mean, I was so self-consumed um, that, you know, uh, if one hair was out of place when I was out drinking, it would ruin my night. I mean, I was so consumed with self and what others thought of me that there was no way humanly possible that I could enjoy life. I was so up in my head. I didn't know that I was up in my head. I had no idea. I lived my whole life from being up in my head. How would I have known any different? And so when this talks about emotional, you know, sobriety, and it talks about, um, you know, the next frontier, I've been um, involved with a group, I think, for the past several years. It's as, you know, I think this pandemic, what it's done with Alcoholics Anonymous really, in a way, is extraordinary. I miss going to meetings. I miss you all in person. I miss sitting and hugging other alcoholics and all that stuff because I've always gone. Even when I didn't want to, I've always gone until I wanted to. But this Zoom is incredible. The, the connection that you can feel really in a room over a computer is extraordinary to me, really. I have a little Wednesday night meeting of women in which I mean, I love those women and some of them I've never met in person and I love them as if I was sitting next to them in an AA meeting. But I've been involved with this little group for the past couple of years. And um, we often talk about, we die of what, we most die of what we think. Um, because I'm telling a story about a story. And if I can begin to see that, I can be free from the bondage of self. I never knew I was in bondage to self. I never understood that. And I love what, um, there's a woman named Mary with a lot of time and she always says, I'm a seasoned beginner. And I love that. Um, Cause I think that about myself. I think that I'm a, a seasoned beginner. Um, so my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean, I have, I have learned so much here. I think the most important word for me in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is we. I think 
the girl that came into the rooms with her fist up, you know, I mean, to everybody around her and particularly to this power called God, called whatever, to be able to see that this whole time, my entire life, I have been taken care of. I feel like often um, God has his hand on the small of my back and just kind of guiding me here, there, and everywhere. You know, no, over here. No, I have someone for you to meet here. No, you need to, you know, I, uh, I never had that before. I never had that kind of a, um, never had that kind of, I guess, comfort and security and understanding. And um, it was always very much I needed to fend for myself. And, uh, and I don't have to do that. And my life isn't perfect. What I'm doing right now, it is incredibly hard. I mean, this is probably the toughest thing I've ever done um, is to take care of somebody who's First of all, 90 is tough in and of itself. I mean, my mom was right in her mind, but she was also 90. And uh, God, that could be a foreshadow for me. Um, to take care of somebody who's 90 is tough, but to take care of somebody who's 90 with dementia, who is um, fading away, who's sort of leaving, and you can't really say goodbye. I mean, because he, you know, a little piece at a time of him goes away so that you can't really say goodbye because it wouldn't make sense to him by any stretch. And it's tiring. I'm tired. My sister and I do it together and we're tired, um, you know, but we don't do it perfectly. We've had some, you know, we have some tough times with each other, you know. Um, but we managed through pretty quickly. And I have to say through that, I have, I only, I just try to rely on getting up in the morning and listening to what this power is trying to tell me and, and, and seeing where have I been selfish? Where am I being dishonest? Where have I done something right? Where have I, where did this work? Where did this not work? I mean, I, I I, I, I just try to rely on the principles that I've been taught in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I don't have any other way to live my life. I know two ways to live, in Alcoholics Anonymous or in a bar. I, I, there's no in-between for me. I don't know any other way. And um, yeah, so I'm in, a, I'm in a tough spot in my life right now. Um, But I, 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 I mean, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of hardship, but there's a lot of joy. I have a little book. Um, when my dad does something cute, <laughs> I write it down because I know that I'm going to forget it one day. And I want to remember that. My father's always been a kind person and he's kind even in his dementia. We're lucky, we know that it's getting tougher. He had a very large fall a couple of weeks ago where we were in the ER and I think this is the beginning of the end. I can see he faded to something that, you know, I don't know, but um, I don't know what to say about that other than I know that I'm here because of a power greater than myself and that I didn't choose this, and yet um, I'm grateful to be here. I know that he cannot think these things about saying thank you and all this kind of stuff, but I know that my father has always lived from here, and I know that he knows here, and we are speaking the language of the heart in this household, because that's what you guys taught me, and so I know that his heart knows that he's well taken care of by these to, he can't even remember her name, so he calls us a hey, lady. And um, he knows that this lady takes care of him. 
And I can tell you, I am a product of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am a product of these principles. I am a product of constantly trying to work whatever it is, step I'm on, whatever I need to see, bring it on, let's go, you and me, God. And, um, and I didn't do that. I didn't do that. You all did that for me. The power of Alcoholics Anonymous did that. And the power of God has done that. And you took a gal that walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous telling God to F off, to being so grateful. So uh, that's all I really have. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. That was wonderful. I really appreciate the uh, life as life is talk. Um, we do offer the uh, person who shares an opportunity to call on a couple people that you're familiar with. If you're interested, if you want me to do the call and I'll be happy to do that as well. What We can't hear you. Yes, I'm sorry. Dawn, you go ahead. Thank you. So, um, you know, when I was listening to you, I was reminded when, when we first um, opened this, up this forum, I, uh, one of the first things that, you know, popped out of the reading for me was the term adult love, you know, and I was like, what does that mean? You know, what does this mean? And what I kind of got to with it was uh, that there's a maturity necessary for me to even claim any possibility of adult love. And, um, you know, my immature demands didn't allow for any of that. And as I hear you talk about the care that you're um, providing, which, I mean, there, there's, you know, there's the familial stuff, but in fact, there's no real expectation of return. You're truly giving from a place that's just the what we do, we give and you raise in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I can really identify with that in my own sobriety at this point. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, it's impressive to me when I am able to do anything without a condition. I'm always surprised that it's even possible for me. And I love what you said, like I couldn't see, see past my own hand. And, you know, and, and if my hair happens to blow the wrong way when I, get, when I open the car door for somebody, oh my God. You know? But um, I mean, I can so identify with everything that shared. So I thank you a lot. Um, one of the things that just has been popping out for me now is that um, let us with God's help continually surrender these hobbling demands. Then, and I'll put it in the eye, I can be set free to live in love. I may then be able to 12 step myself and others into emotional sobriety. And I thought that was a fascinating um, thing with the first one. So 12 step myself, what? And what I realize is that um, it is through giving that I get emotional sobriety. So when I'm actually trying to get out there and do the 12 step work, I'm the one that, you know, that paradoxical uh, recipient of my own actions of giving. And I think it's just a pretty profound statement that I can 12 step myself and others into emotional sobriety. It's pretty radical. Um, I'm gonna call on, let me see. I'm gonna bother Nikki and Ryan out of Phoenix because I just like their names. <laughs> Hello there, I'm Ryan, alcoholic. <clears throat> wow, thank you for your share. That lead was really nice to listen to. I, uh, that was our second time on this meeting and uh, I, I really enjoy the, uh, the format of it. <clears throat> so I got a lot of uh, hearing about the way you were before versus now. And it just reminded me so much of, you know, I, I was about eight years sober and, um, and I was at that place, you know, I was at a, I was at a really 
just a, a tough place. I think it had something to do with through the pandemic and doing Zoom and not making the connections and not not growing as much and whatnot. And uh, and then uh, I was at a meeting and somebody was talking and um, and and it was out of uh, prime time, which is in like New York and, and California, and uh, you know how the disease is uh, showing up in my life today and how am I treating it? You know and and I heard all this stuff and, and it blew my mind. And so I, of course, went over and talked to her and then started uh, reading some new stuff and really going deeper in the principles. And I didn't quite understand. It's like I did the steps and, you know, sponsored people and lived this thing and trying to do it to the best of my ability. And uh, what happened was I didn't, I, I guess I wasn't continuing to grow in, in understanding and applying these principles as a way of life. I just thought I knew enough, I guess, and, uh, and, and, and living like that was a lot of self, you know, I, the obsession of self was still there and it was availing me nothing but suffering, you know, I was getting really icky in, in my life and, um, and I was acting, I was trying to act my way out of it and I felt like you touched on that, uh, gosh, just really well, I was working with a sponsee tonight and when you were talking about that fourth step, uh, and, and the read at the beginning was just reminding me like uh, some people just uh, myself included struggle on those on those things but when you came to that um, uh, realization about maybe you need to sit in it for a little while uh, I think that's what I was doing was I was just holding on to stuff not realizing it and the stuff was self and what I've come to realize is spending more time meditating and, and giving of myself to this power that has all power, you know, that, that I supposedly made a decision to turn myself over to, but yet I wasn't doing that other than in the moments I was praying, you know, and now throughout my days, the more I do that, the more, the more I don't struggle, you know, anytime I do have these struggles, I know it's a time to turn. You know, it's time to turn my attention to this power <laughs> and the answers come and, and everything is solved. And I just wasn't doing that. And it's, it seems so simple to think, oh, all I got to do is turn all the time. But it takes a lot of practice. I think, you know, about the last six months or so, I've just been putting a lot of work into this, into my recovery and growing and understanding and applying and the stuff you're talking about with your parents. Uh, gosh, just awesome. And that's what I'm doing. You know, I, I don't know what to do and I don't have to have all the answers today. I just need to turn and seek and um, they come and, and it's usually not the things I want to do and the things you're doing as well reminds me that I just need to keep doing it and it's not about me, you know. So anyways, uh, thanks for your share. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Guess Nikki's out. You're out, Nikki. Oh, I'll share just right. I'm Nikki, um, Ryan's wife, and I'm not an alcoholic. I'm an Al Anon, but I, I started, I don't know, I can't remember how I came across this page. And we listened a couple of weeks ago when I think Zach was speaking. Um, meetings have been hard to get to. We both had COVID. I'm struggling still. But um, I shared a couple of weeks ago at an Al Anon meeting um, and gave my story. and how I knew I needed more out of my recovery was the, the week leading up to my share, I went to a really dark place and I, I didn't just, I wasn't able to just tell the story I actually went back and like was reliving it. And it was, it was a real difficult, dark time. And so, um, I, I knew that I, I need more, I need more recovery. I need more meetings and emotional sobriety is just right along with, with what I need. So I, I love hearing all this. I, I love listening to AA speakers. I get so much from it. And, and I wasn't that way eight years ago. You know, I was a very different person. So I always say that this 12 step program is making my Grinch heart grow, grow bigger. Thanks again. Thank you, Nikki. This is, um, this isn't an AA meeting. This is for, we, we take, uh, others.
if you will. <laughs> so welcome. Um, let's see, I'm going to choose Missy just because I respect her so much. Thank you, Missy. Thank you, Don. What a nice thing to say. Listen, um, my name is Missy. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, Kristen, it was absolutely terrific to hear you tonight. Thank you. You told so much of my story emotionally. Different events, but and I did swear a little bit, but they didn't allow that here in Marblehead, Mass. They got very upset. Anyway, um, but there were some old timers in our meetings that said, you know, we got to swear until we can't swear anymore. They were pretty cool. But it was great to hear you and I identified with so much of, of what your insides were going through. You know, I had a doctor once. I used to go to psychiatrists and therapists and, oh my God, my whole life since I was a teenager, you know, my parents sent me off trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And I had a doctor once say to me, he said, you know, this was after I got sober because I went back to him. He was, he was a nice fellow. And um, he said, you know, it's kind of a good thing that you did drink because you were so cracked. He said, you would have probably been in a back ward somewhere without booze in you just to get you up in the morning out the door you know, I mean, there were there were nights in the meeting where I couldn't go to a meeting because I didn't have the right outfit to wear. And I would able I would be able to connect that dot when I got when I was sober, that I would do that in high school if I didn't have the right thing head to toe so that I could I had this persona. Oh, my God. I mean, no wonder I drank. I mean, how do you live in a world with that? bondage to yourself the way it was for you I drank just to relieve it just to relieve it for whatever and, and until it caught up to me of course and then to come into AA tumble into AA with a, you know a lot of fires behind me I mean two marriages two different fathers to two different children I mean and for some reason, every time I got divorced, I wasn't able to get any child support. So there was another whole angst. There was a finance. It was everything was a disaster. But apparently that was what was needed to get me into this place we call AA. And then to sit there. And it took me probably the first six to eight years before I felt comfortable in my own skin. I went through hell. I went through hell. My sponsor would say to me get up at night, go out in the living room and the kids are asleep and take a pillow and just rock back and forth. I mean, I was insane. And then I'd have to get up and go to work in the morning. So everything that you said tonight, even though a lot of that was different for me, especially the events of your life, but we are so tied to the emotions. And when I was able to get sober and I knew in my heart of hearts, I needed not to drink anymore. I couldn't drink anymore. It just didn't work, but trying to get sober, I never ever want to have to go through that again. It was absolute torture for me. And I had to find a God that was bigger than me, something bigger than me. I didn't know what that was. And as I've gone along this journey, every time I, I go through something that I've never been through in sobriety before, like getting married in sobriety that was a big one because missy showed up and um i had to find a god that was bigger than the god i had when i walked in the doors of aa and that god has grown whatever that energy is for me i know that i'm not alone anymore and i know looking back over my sobriety i have always been taken care of always god has never let me down and I heard that um, all I have to do is ask. And I ask all the time now. I'm totally powerless over what happens. I can do the footwork. I can get up. I can function as a good adult. I'm a good mother today. My kids are older, grown. I, was a, I, I worked into a very great marriage with my sober husband who passed away a couple of years ago. That was a new deal. I've never been a widow before. I talk about that on occasion. Unbelievable, rock bottom emotions. I didn't drink. They said, no matter what, you're not gonna drink. And I didn't. 
didn't want to. And I had to find myself and reinvent myself. And I'm struggling through that now. It's, it's, it's an amazing, but I can tell you that I've had a tremendous amount of grace around me. God is with me. And, um, you know, I just hopped onto this meeting tonight. It's, it's, um, I'm so glad I did. And if you're ever in New England, come to Marblehead. Really. I'd love to meet you. I'd love to, you know, it's, and I love what you said about Zoom. Aren't we resilient people? Honest to God. Global. I was sitting here last summer. I was about, I think it was when we were really locked down. So a couple, about a year ago. And I was, we were in an Ireland a meeting. Um, I think it was in, yeah, it was in Ireland. And I had a, there was a huge thunder and lightning storm here. And I'm a little, I, I live a little north of Boston, Mass. So my deck door was open and somebody from Ireland chatted with me, put a chat up and said, I can see your thunder. I can hear your, I can hear your thunder and see your lightning. And she's way across the North Atlantic. And I thought, wow, what a miracle. You know, I don't think they have a lot of thunder and lightning in Ireland from what I've heard. But anyway, so she got a, a real show that night. But anyway, Kristen, thank you so much. It's great to hear you and good luck with your, with your dad. Kristen, a um, gentleman put in the chat that uh, six and seven are key, and you'd mentioned that, that you go back to it. Can you, um, do you feel uh, like uh, elaborate on that just a bit? Uh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I have to say, Dawn, uh, the one thing that struck me too out of this reading was exactly what you read. Um, that I think we can work out emotional sobriety if we examine every disturbance we have, great or small. Um, what I'm talking about in six and seven is that, you know, my problems center in my mind. So I'll start talking about, I'll think of something and I'll start telling myself a story not even true but I'm talking you know it's the wheels are turning and I think the thing is is when I catch that and I and I'll give an example of it um when I can catch that and I see what's happening like I can see this story is starting to brew look sometimes it gets into a full-on freaking storm where it's just you know but when I see that it's starting to brew, and it usually starts with, Bill calls it um, some sort of rooted in a dependency. I think dependencies are rooted in fear. So usually for me, it's rooted in a fear. And if I can see what the dependency on, you know, what that fear is trying to do or what it's trying to get me to believe, false evidence appearing real. When I see that, I have to turn that over to six and seven, you know, um, ask for the willingness to have it removed and then being humbly ready, you know. And so I'll give you an example. Um, I had um, a smoking resentment at um, my sister and my cousin who lives close by with us and we all pal around together. Uh, and um, they went out hiking one day with this gentleman, which then who's at home with my dad, me, right? Why wasn't I asked? So here's the story. It's starting. Why wasn't I asked? Oh, you know, they, blah, blah, blah. Those three or more. It just started. It started where all of a sudden smoke was coming out of my ears. I was furious. And I knew it. And I knew there was nothing I could do. So I went to six and seven. And I started praying. I mean, I was praying. I tend to use in six and seven also a mantra that was given me. So I use a little mantra um, because I'll just keep getting hooked into the story. So here I am with my little old dad and I'm smoke is coming out of my ears, which is not a good place to be when you're looking after somebody. And I mean, I'm furious. And uh, this story's going on. And uh, I just 
turned to God in six and seven. And I said, I see this, but I can't get rid of it. You got to do something. And I started to use the mantra. And I said, what do I do? And what came was go vacuum the living room. And I'm like, what? Okay. So I went and I vacuumed the living room and I was still angry. What do I do? You need to go do the dishes. Okay, I'll go do the dishes. The whole time I'm praying and I'm in six and seven and I know I can't get rid of this re little resentment. I got brewing up a storm. And, and the next thing I know, I must have been in that prayer for about an hour. And the next thing I know, it was lifted. It was gone. That was it. It was the end of it. And it's never come back about this guy and them, you know, out hiking and leaving. I mean, it was just, it was over. We know that the storm was over, but I knew that I was in trouble and could not get myself out of that. And that resentment would have gone on all day, all night into the, that's the kind of drunk I am. Like, I don't let go of these things lightly. I'm not the type of girl that just drank a little bit and got drunk and then went home. I was, you know, I wasn't a morning drinker because I was still drinking from the night before, you know? So, uh, you know, I don't have the capacity to get rid of that kind of stuff. But six and seven in prayer does. I had the same thing. I don't know. I was mad about something. I don't even know what it was. I can't even tell you anymore. But anyway, it was a couple, it was about a month ago. I was mad at something. And it was a little bit longer than that. And, and so uh, I said, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to do. Help me here. I'm curious right now. Well, go get your hands in the dirt. What? Yeah, go outside and put your hands in the earth. And I went outside and I just did a little bit of gardening. I came in a half an hour later and I can't even tell you what I was mad at. What was happening is this fear this then I'm dependent on what a, you know what somebody thinks of me what I need to do what my mind is telling me but I can't get rid of that kind of stuff but prayer can six and seven and I, like I said I use a little mantra with it when I'm really stuck and then I can move on it's like um it's weird it's like you're taken over by self and then boom you're free but six and seven is the key behind that for me and I never understood that like take that that which is happening in the moment when it's brewing and it's boiling up, take that into six and seven. And I, it works for me. And I never saw that before until uh, I got with this little group and really started sitting and listening. So I hope that was helpful. Yes, it was. So um, I'm wondering if Mike K could share. Please bring up, uh, I can see you there. Can you hear me? Hi, how are you doing? I'm Mike Kay from the Bronx, and uh, what a great meeting. Someone told me about this yesterday, and, uh, you know, uh, I said, uh, so I'm going to try to get, I'm going to try to get onto it and see. Uh, emotional uh, growth is hard. I'm, uh, you know, trying my hardest to, to um, to fill that hole, you know that uh, that we all talk about with uh, spirituality, you know, for the first time in my life. Uh, I'm not a first time winner. I'm back four and a half years. Uh, I was uh, a workaholic for 15 years and a member of AA 10 years prior. So I had like 25 years of not drinking, but uh, the last 15 years were. Uh, you know, uh, untreated alcoholism. You know, I uh, walked away from AA, walked away from the higher power. Um, I um, was down at the World Trade Center and, uh, you know, I just couldn't believe how something so bad could happen in the structure. I spent seven months there. So coming back to the program uh, and trying to work on myself at such a late stage of my life, but it's still the same it's the exact same thing from when I was, you know, in my 20s, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's really been an eye opener. And, uh, you know, uh, the two years with the pandemic and Zoom, I'm not really a Zoom person. We got back to meetings about a year ago. So I've been hitting a lot of meetings and I really enjoy it. But, uh, you know, sixth and seventh, uh, I, I and, and the third step is what's keeping me keeping me close to my higher power. So uh, thank you 
everybody. I really appreciate it, and I, I hope to tune in uh, next Thursday. Thank you, Mike. I thought I'd jab at you a little bit there since you were chatting it up in the chat. Welcome to our <laughs> welcome to our workshop. Um, Holly and Guy, could you two share? I know you're familiar with Kristen and welcome as well. Yeah. I'm Holly Alcoholic. I'll jump in mm -hmm. first. Okay. Just double check. Um, and um, thank you, Kristen. I, uh, I just texted her that she made me cry. Um, um, you know, um, the language of the heart, the knowing the person that I was, I, I walked into the Denver group with uh, where Kristen was hanging um, when I was about 12 years sober. I had more time than anyone in the room and thought I was all that. And what came to what came about was that I was the sickest one in the room. And, um, and I heard Kristen's story and, uh, and there was hope for me. And, um, and I asked her to take me through, you know, the, the book, I had gone through steps, I hadn't missed a day of AA, I went to meetings two, three times a day. And, um, and I did the service and um, I did steps the way that I was told. And the way I was told was, you know, it was like an era of uh, early eighties was a whole lot of self-help, a whole lot of diluted AA. And I uh, really, my six and seven, I swear to God on the, on the wall steps. I, if you asked me, on a Bible, stack of Bibles, lie detector. This is what I thought it said. It's like I was entirely ready to work on my character defects. And um, that's what I did. And I, nobody tried harder than me. Nobody tried harder than me. I went to therapy. I had group counseling. I had Reiki and therapy. I had rebirthing therapy. I had uh, did science of mind and course of miracle. I did my, the old church of my origin. Um, and nothing was touching what was hurting so bad. And what was hurting so bad was insanity. Insanity is painful, you know, and uh, a delusion that I can run my life is ex ex it's it's beyond painful. And um, you know, and and one of the things this is that I think that six and seven and three steps three are all the second half of the first step. That's just where I have gotten to is that I'm not only, my life is not only unmanageable because of alcohol, it's, be, it's, it's unmanageable because of, um, well, it's always going to be unmanaged by me. And it's not just alcohol. It's about every good idea I come up with or every plan or every time I think that I can run the show. The longer I am sober, the more this is a, a hard word to say, humble. <laughs> I have become and, and asked, begged, said, please, you know, and, and I understand that power, that power that is um, working below the surface. The best I can do is kind of cooperate with this, with the solution. I can't make me well. I can't make me sober. All I can do is show up here and take people through the book. And that's what I did is I got to have an experience that revolutionized my entire life. And, um, you know, what happened is that I got free. I found a way out and I got free. And I think that that's, you know, I'm not all, you know, it says God wants, we're sure God wants us to be happy, joyous and free. Sometimes it's just joyous and free. And sometimes I'm not that happy about certain things going on and all that. But the joy comes from is that I escaped. And I escaped because I put myself in front of a truck that was willing to run me down, didn't give a shit about my feelings. You know, sorry, oops. Um, but thank God, thank God, you know, because my feelings were out to kill me. And um, wow, recovery is beautiful. Recovery is really everything. 
recovered. I am joyous. I moved from LA up to Washington State. I live on a little island and we are in paradise. We're in paradise. And I'm just so happy. And I met the love of my life. And Kristen heard all about him. And I just love you, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, thanks, Kristen, for, for sharing your your experience, strength, and hope. And, and thank you, Don, for, for organizing us and, and leading us. Uh, emotional sobriety. Uh, I uh, since we've since we've moved, uh, the, the the challenges of of, uh, of of the of of life don't change. Uh, we didn't uh, move to get away from anything, and then we moved uh, we moved to uh, to uh, we looked forward to we looked forward to the uh, to the possibility and the potential for growth. I, I think that uh, I don't have a I don't have a lot to to share in emotional sobriety today, though it does offer for me. It offers the the hope of of uh, recognizing false emotional dependencies and 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 uh, and coming to uh, and and coming to uh, a new relationship with my with my program Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I think that uh, that uh, Bill Wilson didn't come to this immediately in the program. He came to it, from what I understand, he came to this later uh, in his in his in his uh, in his realizations of what was available to him, what was possible for him. We're on a I think we're at the beginning of a new a new stage of of, uh, of growth in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm just grateful to hear everybody's uh, experience today. And I, I think I like to keep it simple and leave it at that. So thank you, and thank you for letting me share. Thank you. Is there anybody who wants to share? There's a hand. I do. I oh. do. My name yeah. is Toby. I'm a, I'm a very grateful alcoholic. Thank you. I love where it says, with God's help, continually surrender, surrender these hobbling demands. Then we can be set free to live in love. We may then be able to 12-step ourselves and others into emotional sobriety. So today, God is my sponsor, and I 12-step myself. And um, this is probably the first meeting that I've said that although I've known it for a long time, I choose it. I chose it. I stopped being people dependent. And uh, that was because every time I'm people dependent, um, I end up in a emotional mess. That's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be God reliant. So that's taken a long time. And it involves a lot of trust and a lot of experience with being terrorized by my own mind and in the rooms we hear about you know <clears throat> get a sponsor and if you're sponsoring yourself you're an idiot and uh, that's the storyline since I've been sober I've been sober a long time so um, I've had sponsors and I've read the free literature about sponsors and it's a gift in the beginning to have a woman listen to me and be kind to me so that I could learn how to be kind to myself. And I had to grow a lot and change a lot. And I've chosen to do that. Um, I've also worked through being depressed all the time because I was so angry at myself. And recently my brother put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger and blew his brains out. And um, I can have emotional sobriety um, through my grief and through my mourning and know that that could have been me if I continued to live on that roller coaster and not get help. And for me, AA is not the end all and be all. It's the end all and be all for my alcoholism. God brought me to AA. And I've also availed myself of outside help and other 12-step programs. And I continue to do that because it helps. And I don't want to hurt anymore. I don't want to waste my life anymore. So I'm really grateful to be at this meeting tonight. Thank you all for listening. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you for sharing. Um, Jennifer in New York. 
Hi, um, my name is Jennifer. I'm an alcoholic and I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I was told about this meeting from a really wonderful woman who, um, while she's not here in this meeting, she's become a really good support system. Um, she's not my sponsor, but um, my mom has uh, was has some history with the program and told me that I was allowed to have more than one sponsor or get as much knowledge from people as I possibly can. Um, so I um, I guess um, I'm I'm a, I'm a newcomer rel relatively. I've less than a year, um, seven months, and I am um, really really trying to learn this this emotional sobriety stuff because. Um, well, you know, we all need it, but um, I, I'm on this. I'm on step four, and um, um, I'm less scared of it now. But what's what's got me even today, and the reason that I knew I had to even come to this meeting is, um, I am, I am having a really hard time letting go of the idea that um, uh, that I get to have righteous anger. Um, I just did the reading where um, it said that alcoholics do not uh, do not get that luxury. Um, and anger kind of fuels me uh, in, in, in good way. I mean, it's led to some good outcomes and some obviously very bad. Um, but to the point where, um, you know, I had a, an off exchange with my roommate and I was really frustrated and then I thought, I thought that to myself. And then I thought, there's no, there's no way that I'm not allowed to be annoyed. Because if I have to force myself to not be annoyed at this annoying situation, that's pouring pink paint on it. And it's denying the reality of the situation. And that's when I'm going to drink is when I'm not in reality. So um, I will put my number in my... Um, I don't know if that, I don't know if this is appropriate, but it's really, it's, I, I literally have said out loud to multiple people, I will miss the righteous anger and the resentment more than the booze. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling with the um, not being able to be in basically indignant all of the time, um, but it's not serving me. So anyways, thank you for listening. That was wonderful, Jennifer. Uh, let's see, where's my uh, my good friend, Sam? I'm Sam, I'm an alcoholic. And um, God, what a great meeting. It's so good to see you, Don. And um, so recently I've started this, uh, I was really dumb. Like I, I'm, I turned 40 and I was like, I started putting on all this weight and stuff and I was working out, not really pushing myself. So I signed myself up for this boxing training camp um and where i have to have a fight and i've got all these like young crossfit you know like tall big guys so my buddy said hey to get an edge we're going to get you this trainer uh this and so i ended up getting like this jamaican uh pro trainer guy and he's had me uh at first they just have you like hitting mitts you know like you, the whole time like for eight rounds i'll have you like hit this and he'll call out the shots and then like if you do a bad shot he'll go like that's not it that's not it and then like he's Jamaican. So like when you hit a really good one, you do a good combination. He goes, thank you. Thank you. And uh, so I started. Uh, so last week they started the actual like sparring stuff like a week or two ago. And I remember in the fight camp, they put me in the ring with this really big dude. And my brain just goes like, I don't want to do this shit. I want to go home. I'm tired. It's 730 at night. This is a stupid idea. And uh, I remember like I got fatigued and I got hit a couple good times. There's a point to all this. Uh, but I got fatigued and I got hit a couple times and I was like, man, I really don't want to do this. Like, and I, and I had to go back the next day and I'm like, just come on, man. There's a talk. There's a, I was having a talk with myself where I couldn't see a way to go back to that. It's like, this, there's, this is nonsensical. Like, why are you doing this? Like nobody would, this is stupid. This, these kids are, these guys are, it'd be like a bunch of guys who would sign up to go, you know, wrestle or fight, you know? And, and so 
but I couldn't chicken out. So the next day I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I was anxious going back into it. And I started allowing myself to relax when I got hit and I started to get through it and I started to have fun with it, you know, but I definitely couldn't see myself going around it. And, um, and that's kind of been like, and then lately the last couple of days, I've just been having a blast with it. You know, I'm having fun with this, uh, this trainer took me to this real boxing gym, you know, where there's all these guys and, and we were fighting today. And I was like, is there anything you want me to work on? And he goes, no, nah, man, you don't need to think about it. Just do it. If you think about it, you won't do it. You just need to get in there and do it. Just, it'll come out if you just, you know, all your training will come out. And for me, what AA has given me is, you know, the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, like really strengthening those disciplines, like meditation, you know, doing an, I do an evening review every night. I write it down. Even if it seems stupid, I write out what I, I live my life in the framework of 86, 87, and 88. And what happens is I find myself, um, I find myself in the midst of life, um, reacting appropriately most of the time. And I find my, my mind has started to live way more in the present. It used to live like years out, then it used to live months out. Now it's pretty much in today. That pinball is pretty much in today. And I tell you, I'm a chronic alcoholic. I have the mind of a chronic alcoholic and like, you know, what a beautiful share, Kristen. Thank you so much. That just, it really touched my heart, you know, but you start thinking about when you become a practitioner of the step work, Nobody trains you for the stuff. You know, I, I, I think that one of my major dependencies has been comfort for a long time. One of my major dependencies is comfort. Like I want to be comfortable all the time. I don't want to feel afraid and I don't want to have to be challenged or to be stretched in any area, but I do. And so, you know, for me, I heard a, a Dak Shepard was doing this podcast the other day. And uh, he said, a great screenplay is one in which every scene is an allegory for the entire movie. It's allegorical for the entire movie. So each, each scene sums up what the movie is uh, all about. And I was thinking like, that's how, that's kind of like been the theme of my life lately. Like everything is kind of allegorical towards this place of uh, being surrendered, relaxing, not trying to engineer my life to bring myself joy or comfort. Joy and comfort just come from living life you know, and so does pain and so does suffering and it's okay to feel pain and it's okay to feel uncomfortable. Um, and you know, I have a, a hot, I have one of these like hot steamers of a brain that like, um, Kristen was saying, like, I'm either in, a, I'm either in a bar or I'm in AA. I don't do abstinence well at all. I don't do, my brain does not do untrained abstinence, uh, worth of crap. And, um, you know, lately, I don't think that anything, um, I guess for a long time, I, I grew up in AA and I always thought that um, because uh, I always thought that because I've been to so many AA meetings, it's almost programmed to me that other people don't live. And I know everybody says, well, I know there's these principles that have been talked about forever and people, you know, there's lots of people who don't go to AA who practice these principles. I don't think I would have ever been um, given a fraction of the life that I have now, or wouldn't have been able to react in any possible way as a man I would respect without Alcoholics Anonymous. But lately I've been seeing a lot of men that live their life, not like I did. You know, they live their life in the present moment. They live their life calm. They don't have to react to everything. And then I see guys who, who react. I mean, it, it was Bob D that said a long time ago, he goes, you can tell a room full of untreated alcoholics, not by the ones who are drinking, but by the ones who when they're absent. You know, like I can generally pick those, I could generally spend time with, you know, 15 people in a room and when they're absent, I can tell which ones probably have, uh, you know, what I have. And for me, you know, I think that, um, anyway, I, I've shared enough, but so much now I have that, that boxing trainer in my head all the time, you know, like when I'm stressed out at work or something like that, you know, it's like, you just gotta be calm, man. Just, be calm and relax, pray about it, stay in the, stay in the thing, stay in the, stay in the, stay in the movement. And, um, you know, if I stay sharp in the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, then it comes into my awareness when I'm being brought into a really nasty dependency. And one of, like I said, one of the main dependencies that I've had, that's, you know, been 
I've been so blinded by for a long time is a dependency on having to be comfortable all the time. So, you know, um, and, and I'll tell you that by not, by being uncomfortable, by forcing myself to be uncomfortable in several different situations lately, and they're all self-inflicted, I've felt a great deal of joy and happiness as being, a, you know, having pushed, been pushed into areas that make me uncomfortable. I've never made huge strides in my life without being uncomfortable and without being terrified and showing up anyway. And what always happens is that God always provides what I need in the moment that I'm in. A lot of times I want to know what the surplus is or what his plan is, but God always provides. If I stay in the moment and I stay in 10, 11, and 12, then intuition comes, power comes, things come, things work out and organize. And I'm able to walk in the moment if I'm not all clenched up and freaked out, you know? So anyway, that's all I got. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks, Sam. I'll tell you a little blurb. I was uh, training for a triathlon, uh, half Ironman. I did this thing, but the, uh, which I'm still proud of because it's indeed miraculous. But I was in, I was training, and you never train for all three events. It's swimming, biking, running. You never train for all three events until the day comes, and then you have to do all three at once. So I asked the trainer, I said, how am I going to know that I can do this all three at once? I've never done it. And he said, trust your training. And I like what you said, because I've, I've really relied on that thought pattern in recovery is trust your training. When, you know, when the crap hits the fan, you got to trust your training. And Kristen, I'm here and you're trusting your training right now. And um, so what happened was I was standing, I was, I had my wetsuit on. I was in, you know, in the pool, in the pit with all the people getting ready to get in the water. And I had goggles and my goggles broke. And I was like, this is great. I don't have to do it. So I, call, so I call my trainer and I say to him, the goggles broke. He said, go up to the microphone and ask him, does anybody have a set of goggles? Turn right around. They handed me my exact goggles back. And I was like, all right, God, here we go. So <laughs> I say all that to say that when I'm trusting my training, as it were, that I've done the things and I know I've done the things, when the shit hits the fan at the end, God shows up and replaces anything that needs to be filled in, like fill in the blanks. So it's just always a really, you know, it's just a little story, but it means so much to me, that story. Cause when those goggles broke, I knew it was game over. I'm done, moved right in. Um, Kristen, we're very close to the end of the meeting. And I wanna know if you have any um, final comments or anything you wanna bring up in terms of, um, you know, what you're working on spiritually. I think you've already told us quite a bit, but I'll take anything else you got. Um, I wanna thank everybody uh, for a great meeting. Um, yeah, I definitely, um, you know, when Sam was talking, I was uh, listening to you, Sam, and when you were talking about 10, 11, and 12, those are definitely, um, I don't know. I, 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 they are definitely the discipline steps or maintenance steps as, as they've been called. Um, I had a friend who told me, Kristen, the point of meditation is not to become a good meditator. The point of meditation is to improve your conscious contact with God. But I believe, you know, I had some great teachers in Alcoholics Anonymous. One of them was Tom's sponsor who lives in my bones. And I think the biggest thing, and it's, I think this is so prevalent in my life right now, he used to say, and I know many of you have heard this, but it's, it's when I'm not telling the story about the story, about the story, about the story. I didn't come in as Kristen. I'm not going out as Kristen. And what he used to say is, I am a spiritual being having a human experience. And, um, and that is, um, I think, the biggest thing I keep foremost in my mind. Let the spirit talk. Let the spirit guide you. Let this power tell you what the story is. Because I'm telling you, my head will not um, guide me in the right direction. I've had too much, uh, too much of Christian in my lifetime and um and somewhere along the line i turned this corner thank god and um 
And I just try to rely on that spirit as much as I'm capable. And, um, and often I fail at that, and yet the spirit keeps showing up. So I thank you all for a great meeting. Dawn, thank you for leading a great meeting. Um, if I lived in Virginia, we'd be buddies, I can tell. I'm an artist as well. So hopefully um, I can come back. It's just a little late for me, but um, really appreciate everybody's shares and a lot of people on here I know and love. And I love you all because I understand Alcoholics Anonymous and we just have that deep bonding connection. So thanks, Don. Thank you. And Sam, I